On your Friday episode of Locked On Raptors, I take your listener questions, digging into topics like what the hell happened with Jeff Doughton Jr.? Is there failing confidence in the front office as the season winds to a close? What's going to happen this summer if things go awry? Plus, Precious Achua on Love is Blind or Scotty Barnes on Dirty Jobs? What's better? We'll get to those questions and so many more on today's episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1376 of Locked On Raptors for Friday, April the 7th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for nine seasons on various platforms. You can find all of my work over on Twitter, at Woodley Sean. You can go and follow the Locked On Raptors Instagram page. Just search up Locked On Raptors. You can't miss it. Also, we are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts, so please go support the show there. Also, and it's important today because it's a mailbag show, uh discord there's a new discord server for lockdown raptors listeners i've created it up there is a invite link in the description right beneath this episode whether you're listening on audio or on video please go join the lockdown raptors discord it's been super fun in there lots of uh there's like a little section in there for insane takes that aren't good for the light of day but you got to get off your chest there's a general chat there's mailbag questions i'm actually going to prioritize mailbag questions from the discord going forward it's free to do jump on in there the link in the description is the place to go and come hang out it's a really really fun and uh nice and pleasant community where we can go and get angry or happy about our favorite basketball team so go in there and support the discord and uh, i look forward to seeing you in there and reading your mailbag questions that come from your participation today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at fanduel the number one sports book in all the land. And uh, right now, you can go check them out. They're the official sports book of Locked On. And make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started today. All right. Let's get to it. Your mailbag questions came flowing in. Again, I'm going to prioritize going forward mailbag questions that come via the Discord. we got lots of really good ones in there. So if you want to be uh, someone who gets your questions read out on the podcast, join the Discord server. It's very easy. It's a, it's, it's a good time in there. I think it's going to try to be a very pleasant, happy zone where you can be free of the ills of the rest of the internet and just uh, chat about the ball with some people who also want to chat about ball. Anyway, let's get to your questions. we got a couple off the top. One from Instagram, one from Discord, both about Jeff Doughton Jr. We'll start with Matt950 from Instagram. How disappointing is it that Jeff Doughton seemed to have earned Nick Nurse's endorsement but was still not converted? So if you missed this yesterday, seems as though Jeff Doughton is not going to have his contract converted to a regular NBA deal from the two-way he's on. This has been one of the topics of the week uh, in Raptors world. And look, I understand there are like process reasons to be disappointed with this, Um, you know, from playing Jeff Doughton a bunch early in the season in games where he did not actually get on the floor when he wasn't really needed to be dressed. He could have been down with the G League, not burning days. Instead, they burned a bunch of his days without playing him, leaving them pretty short on the back end of the season. That's not awesome. There's the whole sort of degradation of the Raptors development pipeline we've talked about this quite a bit it's been a reason why the team has very very much struggled this year there's no depth there's no bench there's just there's not a lot in the way of prospects on the come but there are a couple we'll get into you know the the offseason stuff in, in a little bit as well and why I think there's maybe hope for a little more depth next season but this season it's obviously not been there the pipeline's been barren obviously a big part of it is you win the championship and that's the cost of the championship you send out a lot of assets first round picks etc even second round picks just being sent out the door as trade sweeteners it's gonna have an accrual and it's gonna come back to bite you at some point I think we might be kind of in the phase where they're bursting out of that at some point here with the first round pick coming in this year Christian Coloco looking pretty good Jeff Doughton as much as he wasn't converted still could be on the team next season and be a developmental success story still Um, but yeah this is for me I I think it's way more about sort of the process stuff. And I think like I can hear those arguments of, hey, like, why would you do this over? Why would you keep Jeff Doughton over a Joe Wies camp? Why would you sign a Joe Wies camp to not play him and then have this situation come and burble up at the end of the season when you could have just converted Jeff Doughton earlier? That type of stuff. Like, I get all that. I understand there's a disappointment in the process here. 
I also think maybe, just maybe, it's okay to get a grip because it's Jeff Doughton Jr. we're talking about. A guy who has averaged 2.4 points a game, not played a whole lot of minutes. Yes, he's been excellent defensively. We know this. He's been very, very good on that end of the floor. What is the thing the Raptors need more of than defense? It's uh, guard creation and offensive punch off of the bench, and Jeff Doughton doesn't bring that. Again, no fault of his own. He's not been asked to play a very large or burdensome role, but he's still, I- I've talked about it this week on the very podcast, like he is not a very aggressive offensive player. He doesn't look for his shots. He is a pretty you know wobbly three-point shooter, 31% this season from deep. He's not exactly like some prized prospect that you're letting go. A, they're not even letting him go, technically speaking. They have his restricted free agency rights this offseason, meaning they can sign him to a deal and some other team's going to have to sign him to an offer sheet and have the Raptors not match it. No one's going to sign Jeff Doughton Jr. to an offer sheet. I can promise you that. And so if the Raptors want Jeff Doughton around, they can do that still this offseason and pay him more than he was ever going to make getting his contract converted for the rest of this season. So I I don't think it's like all that big a deal in the big grand scheme of things because Jeff Doughton Jr. is not a game-changing player for the Raptors. As much as he's been a nice story, he's not changing the game in a play-in series or in the playoffs. He probably wouldn't even play in a play-in series of the playoffs because the rotation is probably going to be trimmed down to six, seven, or eight as per Nick Nurse's typical way of operating. Um, As far as, you know, the whole Wieskamp versus Doughton or, you know, Delano Banton or whomever, like, yeah, I would like to have seen Jeff Doughton converted. I think he's more useful to the team than some of the guys they could have moved on from. But I also understand if they've made promises to Joe Wieskamp and Delano Banton um, and Will Barton, obviously, about whatever their role is going to be with the team. You don't want to renege on those promises to give Jeff Doughton a look. When you can still keep Jeff Doughton on the team long term, it's just you're costing, you know, yourself potentially three to nine games worth of Jeff Doughton. Again, in a stretch of the season where he's probably not going to be all that big of an impact. And if he is forced into a big role in a playoff series against the Milwaukee Bucks, something's gone horribly wrong probably anyway. So I kind of get it. This brings me to the next question here from Ben Chapman from the Discord. Uh, again, get in the Discord, baby. Ben asks, do we think the consternation around Jeff's, Jeff Doughton's impending roster status was way more to do with an inherent lack of trust in the front office than anything to do with Jeff Doughton? And I think the answer to that is probably yes. Like, you know, Jeff Doughton is, again, a fine player. He's done a lot to earn himself an NBA job. He also has the same career stat line with the Raptors that Macy O'Bastin did as far as, like, production and games played. Uh, So, like, we're not really talking about someone who's going to change the the, the course or the the future direction of the franchise or anything like that. As much as I like Jeff Doughton, again, I'm not trying to denigrate the dude, but, like, we need to be realistic here. He's probably, like, a 12th man (laughs) at best on a really good team. Um, as far as the consternation around it, yeah, like I feel like it's pretty obvious the confidence in the front office has dwindled. And if you're the type of person who wants to see front office change, I get it. Like that's what happens in sports. Front office does bad thing, front office loses job. That's typically been the way things operate. Personally, I'm more on the side of I think this team is probably headed in the right direction and could use a coaching change more than anything else. I think Nick Nurse, maybe the message has just kind of run dry. The whole Nick Nurse of it all with the Jeff Doughton thing adds a layer of consternation and intrigue for sure, considering he has given Jeff Doughton his blessing and the front office decided not to convert him. That speaks to the perhaps disconnect we're seeing between the front office and Nick Nurse. I think we're very much in the last few days of Nick Nurse here. I do not see how this gets salvaged going forward. That's a whole other thing. But if you're the type of person who wants to clean house entirely, I get it. I would also caution the sort of, hey, well, we can fix this by just getting rid of the decision makers and bringing in new decision makers. You know, if you want to get on the sort of, if you want to get granular with it, obviously Bobby Webster is the front-facing GM these days. Masai Ujiri is more the figurehead at the company. If you are... Looking for front office change, I would say Bobby Webster makes more sense as like the guy to be the fall guy for what's going on this season, more so than Masai Ujiri, just because 
truthfully, I'm not sure how involved Masai Ujiri is in the sort of day-to-day everything that's going on. Yes, he's going to have final approval over trades and stuff, but I don't really know. If this is a hard question. This is a hard thing to solve. I'm just kind of inferring from my observation. It seems as though Bobby Webster is far more involved in the day-to-day stuff than Masai is, and so maybe that's the sort of happy compromise for those who want to see the front office gone, is maybe you move on from Bobby Webster, promote someone from within or whatever, and then you keep Masai Ujiri around. The reason I caution against just cleaning house entirely is you're not finding another Masai Ujiri. I'm sorry. I know the the confidence in him is waning, but as a figurehead of a franchise, as someone who commands respect around the NBA, as someone who is always being poached after by other teams, it seems like he's going to get scooped up immediately if he does move on from the Raptors. I've always kind of maintained I think his next job is not even in basketball. I think it's like political office or some sort of diplomatic thing because that's Masai Ujiri. Like he's just he's, he's larger than life, larger than basketball. But there's no denying that Masai Ujiri is the figure, figurehead of your franchise. That's a place you want to be. And as much as the concern over the team's direction over the last couple of years has creeped in, and I should say, it's only the results of this season that have really prompted the concern about the direction, I'd argue. Last year, they go 48 and 34. No one seems too upset about how things are going. And even in the offseason, there wasn't all that much displeasure with the team not doing a whole lot to improve what were pretty clear perceived holes you know, obviously, they gambled wrong thinking the de- development was going to come for Precious Achua and, you know, other other areas of the team. They gambled wrong on Otto Porter Jr.'s health. That all stinks, but ultimately, there's still been a lot of good, Scotty Barnes being one of them. I mean, like, we talk about the, the, the back-end roster stuff, but it seems as though they got the Scotty Barnes pick right, which is pretty bloody impressive considering the concern about that pick at the time. And so, look... I'm not really saying a whole lot here. I think, you know, the the coaching change, I think, is the most likely off-season shakeup for sure. If you are the type of person who wants to see Bobby Webster removed, I don't totally begrudge you, even though I think, you know, it's hard to really make big decisions in the front office, you know, when you consider the overall track record of Bobby Webster and Masai Ujiri as a tandem. They've won them the championship. Like, there, there's still a lot of equity there. Maybe I'm a fool for hanging on to that equity too long, but I don't think you just forget how to be good at your job. Maybe there's adaptation that has to happen. There's maybe getting a little bit off of your own supply that has to happen. I think that's maybe taking place here, maybe a little organizational hubris, but... I don't think that they're just like suddenly awful moron front office executives, right? I I think it's probably a little bit more, uh, it's it's a nuanced thing. It's not black and white. There's a lot of different things that have gone into this season not being so hot for the Raptors. Um, But as far as the the concern with the Jeff Doughton thing, yeah, I think if it weren't for the swirling rumors regarding Nick Nurse and the the sort of lead up of confusing moves and other stuff that's gone on this season with the front office. I don't think the Jeff Doughton thing is front page news the way it seems like it's been. Truthfully, I have a hard time having that that strong an opinion on Jeff Doughton in general. It's just it's just not something I feel like wading into with all of my soul. But uh, hey, people can disagree. We're going to come back on the other side, dig into some other questions about what might happen this offseason for the Raptors and what should happen this offseason. We'll get into those very momentarily. Before we do that, time to tell you about this week's Nissan Aria Electric Player of the Week. Of course, it's always a big a big struggle figuring out who this player is going to be when the Raptors are not playing so hot. And, and like, look, they've, they've won games. They also lost to the Celtics in pretty unfortunate fashion. But that said, OG Ananobi feels like this week's Electric Player of the Week, brought to you by the all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. OG's really good, man. Yes, he's had a couple of off-shooting nights mixed into some really, really hot shooting nights, but his defense has been outstanding. The extra creation he's doing, the extra secondary stuff where he's attacking closeouts and scoring, walking paint touch, all of it. He's electric. He's brilliantly fierce in the way he guards the opposing team's best player and elegantly powerful in the way he throws down those uh, reverse dunk chin-up things that he gets on cuts from Jakob Pertl passes. He delivers on the duality of all the different things you get with the Nissan Aria, the fierceness and elegance, the beautiful but strong. He's everything. He's, he's beautiful and strong. That's for damn sure. The 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin you to your seat power and premium intelligence all in one EV. The all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. 
All right, let's continue on here with your first listen of the day, digging into the Toronto Raptors uh, mailbag questions that you lovely folks have sent in as I try to find them on my little producer dashboard thing here. All right, let's get to this next question here. Also from Discord member, Santi Espinoza. Shout out to Santi. Uh, if we don't make it to the playoffs, what are the odds of a drastic change to the roster, i.e. would Fred or Pascal be on their way out? I think I am not in the business of making grand sweeping decisions off of one-off basketball games. Like, anything can happen in a play-in game. DeMar DeRozan is probably going to break the spirit of an entire city. Just be prepared for that. It's going to probably happen. Um, I don't think you can make big sweeping changes about the team based on what happens in the play-in. I ultimately think what's happened in the lead-up to the play-in is the stuff that really matters when we're talking about what's going to happen this summer. Um, you know, Sure, they could go out and lose by 50 in the play-in game, and maybe that just makes everybody kind of, uh, you know, no one's off limits as far as what changes could be because it's that embarrassing. I just tend to think making decisions off of 48 minutes of basketball one way or another that's not a good process that's not the way to go about things uh the 26 games leading into the the playoffs yeah i think there's certainly arguments for and against all of these guys as far as should they be part of the future going forward i tend to think what's most likely here is fred resigns pascal probably gets extended this offseason if if the raptors have their way and they kind of kick it down the can a little bit in terms of making full grand sweeping decisions and i'll say it again I just don't think it's good business to be trading away Fred Van Vliet or Pascal Siakam when you have Scotty Barnes on the rise. I know this gets me roasted in the YouTube comments all the time by the anti-Fred faction, but I'm sorry. Fred Van Vliet is a very good basketball player. Every single, every single thing suggests this guy affects basketball positively when he's on the floor, and to not have his high-volume three-point shooting, his ball handling, his playmaking on a team where Scotty Barnes is just not going to be ready to be the sole guy, the heliocentric force that some folks seem to want him to be, I think that's really bad. I think that's a bad thing for Scotty Barnes' development. I think that's a bad thing for the team being good next season. And Pascal and Fred, as much as people have their misgivings, if they are the second and fourth best players on the, the, the Scotty Barnes Raptors, I think that's a pretty good spot to be. Um, and I think that's very likely what's going to end up happening here is OG continues to ascend as Scotty eventually takes the reins. That's how I kind of see this hierarchy establishing itself. And Fred Van Vliet has shown more than a capacity for being a table setter, for being a playmaker who also supplements it with his very important pull up and catch and shoot three point shooting. I don't think either of those guys really is on the table this summer, considering how the team has played, how good the starters have been since the arrival of Jakob Pertl. Again, things could change. Uh, a big, massive offer could come out of nowhere for sure. Maybe the, the front office and the, the whole situation boils over and maybe there's a panic trade to be had because someone feels like they're, they're, they're worried about their job. You hope that doesn't happen. We call that a Brian Colangelo in the biz. That would be not, not, not be good. But um, ultimately, I don't think what happens next Wednesday or Tuesday potentially. No, I guess it'll be Wednesday in all likelihood. They're not making the eighth seed at this point. I, I would be shocked if the Hawks go and blow it over the weekend and, and don't pick up at least one win against their remaining competition um but yeah it's just it's just not good business to make decisions based off of one play-in game the lead into the play-in is far more important data and i think the data suggests the players the top end players on the team are not really the problem here it's maybe more depth coaching that type of stuff Another question here. This one comes from ESP325, a Discord member as well. Look at that. You get in the Discord. You get in on the podcast. Assuming we go into next season with the same starting five, what do you think a five-man bench unit that plays behind them should look like? Players currently on the roster are archetypes for potential additions. Uh, any notable improvements uh, that we could see from current players to help flush that out all as well? This is a great question. This is something I've been thinking about a lot, actually, as far as bench construction, how it all comes together. A lot of it hinges upon what do they do with Gary Trent Jr., right? Like, does Gary Trent Jr. get a new contract? I think he's probably played himself out of, like, a massive deal. I don't think he's going to get some big contract from some other team in free agency. He's not the type of player that teams go and use their very, very hard-won cap space on, especially losing teams. I think, I think Gary Trent Jr. is the kind of player who you add to a pretty good team. You, he offers you supplemental shooting. Maybe he's not a necessity for your team to be very good, but you love having him around for that shot making. Um, turns out the shot making is like one of the things the Raptors need the most. So I'm inclined to think 
they're probably going to bring Gary Trent Jr. back. And I'm fine with that because I don't think the money is going to be nuts. I, I would be surprised if it's like a $20 million plus annual salary for Gary Trent Jr., especially considering Jakob Pertl, it seems like it's been sort of it alluded to all along that he's probably going to come in but somewhere, somewhere between like 16 and 20 um, per year. For Gary Trent Jr. can't then be like, give me them as much as that guy. I just don't see it happening. I feel like Trent probably falls somewhere in between the Chris Boucher range and the Jakob Pertle range. He might even get a small uh, like reduction in his annual salary on his next deal, but maybe it's a trade-off for years and comfort and, and stability and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I do think Gary Trent Jr. will be back, so that's one guy in place. You got your six-man basically set. I think Christian Coloco is going to be the backup center next season. He might not be ready for it for 82 games. Maybe you have to have some sort of contingency plan. Precious Achua probably becomes that guy, even though he's not best as a center, as a fill-in center. I feel like you can kind of make it work, especially if you're playing lineups like he played to close against the Celtics, where he's like a switchability uh, guy for you in there at center. It's a very different look at the five than you have with Jakob Pertl or Christian Coloco. But I think Coloco has shown me enough. I think he can be a you know, 15 to 20 minute a night backup behind Jakob Pertl next season, given a good summer of development and work. Um, there will be some offensive hurdles for sure, but I feel like you get him running pick and roll with Fred Van Vliet. You get him working with, with Scotty Barnes, Pascal Siakam. You get him uh, as that back line of defense for second units. The Raptors have been just tremendous defensively when he's been on the floor this season. That I don't think is going anywhere. If anything, it's going to get better and more refined. And so I think Coloco becomes your backup center. You got Gary Trent Jr. in there. I would love to see the addition of some kind of ball handling, shooting, sort of guy who can run your second unit offense. Because I don't think Gary Trent Jr. is that guy. Gary Trent Jr. is going to be the trigger man with your second units. And yes, they're going to sprinkle in starters. It's not going to be a five-man bench look or anything like that. But if you can get some sort of ball handler, I really like it. I, I like the idea, especially of sort of just changing up the mix a little bit on that bench. And I'm looking at Precious Achua and most importantly, Chris Boucher as a potential trade piece this summer. Chris Boucher, pretty decent back backup, like has has a lot of good stuff going for him, would fit really nicely on a team that loves to hammer the offensive glass as a lot of teams have tilted that direction and really started to prioritize that once again after a bit of a fallow period for offensive rebounding. Um, and so maybe there's a match there with some team that has that sort of ingrained in their philosophy. And my thinking there is if you swap Chris Boucher out for some sort of guard, uh, you kind of rebalance things a little bit. You go into next season with your sort of core four bench guys being X acquired guard, a guy I have in mind is like TJ McConnell from the Pacers, a team with a thousand guards and no forwards. Maybe there's a Boucher McConnell swap that's not crazy there. I've actually talked with our pal Tony East from Locked On Pacers about that, and he said, hey. Not crazy. That that could act. That's like a real trade that could actually happen this summer. Uh, as much as the Pacers love T.J. McConnell, they have so many guards on their roster right now. Andrew Nemhard, obviously on the on the rise. Ben Matherin, Tyrese Halliburton, Chris Duarte. They're they're the loaded with guard depth, and so maybe that's like a need for need type trade that we've seen a little bit more of in the NBA. As I think the sort of salary situation, it's gotten tough to match money and uh, a take on money without sending some out just because a lot of teams are, are spending a lot of bucks, um, a lot of restrictions, obviously, on trades. It's very hard. And maybe it's just easier to make need for need trades by for guys who make similar amounts of money. Um, so maybe that's a, a potential avenue there to sort of reestablish what the bench looks like. So if you have X guard that you've traded Chris Boucher for, for example, or Precious Achua, Ben Chapman from the Discord mentioned in our uh, fake trades channel in the Discord, um, you know, the, the idea of maybe Precious Achua gets you a better return. Maybe like a Precious Achua for Davion Mitchell swap makes sense. Uh, a, a Kings team that could use some wing defense, maybe has a bit of a surplus of guard play. Um, you know, that's, that's I, I'm not, not against that as far as fake trades go. Shout out to Ben for that. Again, join the Discord and you'll get to be part of all sorts of fake trade machination talk. It's great. Um, anyway, you get a guard that you've traded one of your forward depth guys for, uh, probably Boucher, but maybe Precious. You got Gary Trent Jr. You throw in Scotty or OG or Pascal or whomever you want from the starters to sprinkle in with those bench lineups as your sort of wing in those groups. Then you've got Precious Achua or Chris Boucher, probably Precious Achua and Christian Coloco. And then you're in a position where if Otto Porter Jr. emerges from the ground, foot, foot totally intact, dislocated toe reattached, 
then that's just bonus gravy. You have Otto Porter Jr. as essentially your 10th man, and if he can come back and even be sort of healthy, we saw the impact he had in just the eight games he played this season. That is pretty interesting to me. You figure Jeff Doughton as well. You've got your first-round pick who's going to factor in, too. We'll probably have to earn some minutes, which is never a bad thing, I think, for a rookie. Um, And I think the depth issues stand a very real chance of, with the right moves this offseason, making some sense. And look, all of this hinges on the Raptors. Back to the thing we talked about in the first segment. All of this hinges on the Raptors fully threading the needle on the very difficult offseason they've set themselves up for. I don't think they would have set themselves up for it if they didn't think they could pull it off with three pending UFAs, but I do think it's very real chance that they will do it. Problem is, if they don't, it's a whole big mess. And, and, and so, to me, it kind of reminds me of, if you've ever played the game Ticket to Ride... If you're ever familiar with this, it's a board game, uh, if you haven't played, where you have to build trains across whatever the map is, Europe, there's an India one, there's an Africa one, there's an Italy one, the original one's based in the States. Either way, the essential conceit of the game is build the longest set of trains to all the different destinations that you've got to build to. And in that game, you try to plot ahead, like, hey, I'm going to build this thing to there, this thing to there, and I should be able to do it, I got the right number of pieces, I've got it all sorted out, but then sometimes... Someone you're playing with maybe gets wind of what you're trying to do and then builds a train right in your way and there's nothing you can do about it. There's a chance that the Raptors offseason gets ticket to ride it, essentially, and the whole plan falls apart and then you're sitting there with like negative points, Uh, you know, just kind of handed, oh, I didn't get that destination, got to give up those points, didn't get that destination, got to give up those points. If this analogy doesn't work for you, fine. But essentially, they're right at the precipice. It seems like the plan has come together here. And if you go into next season with the guys that they should be able to go into next season with, maybe the depth issues are not not a problem anymore. Maybe the team is kind of set for that jump that was expected this season on a one-year delay. But if it all comes crashing down and the offseason does not go to plan and they can't re-sign these guys and things get messy, boy, oh boy, then your game is screwed, and then I think it's really time to start looking at the front office and getting really, really concerned about what the plan and direction is. But I'm willing to give it until this offseason has kind of been seen through to make a full judgment on have they lost their fastball or something like that. We're going to come back on the other side, get into a couple last questions, including some silly ones, also a couple of fun ones, uh, and round out the show. Before we do that, however, got to tell you about our friends over at FanDuel the number one sports book in North America. The NBA playoffs are almost here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to three-pointers drained. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. If you're stressed about the play-in game, a bit of a happiness hedge might be the way to go. You bet on your boy DeMar DeRozan to win if the Raptors and Bulls do, in fact, play the play-in game. And if the Raptors lose, you win some money, so you're not feeling so bad. And if they win, you're like, oh, well, I lost some money, but that's fine. The Raptors are on to the playoffs. That's cool, too. Don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA and of Locked On. All right. We continue on, closing out the show with your mailbag questions. A couple last ones to come through. This one comes from G Rex from the Six, also a Discord member. Hmm, running theme here. If the Raptors do lose in the play-in, uh, who should they draft? I don't know much about the outside of the top five. However, I think it would be really important to draft another guard. Um, yeah, so truth be told... I haven't done enough draft research to really have a strong answer on this one. I will. Once the season's over, we're going to go into full draft mode. We'll get our pal Raphael Barlow from NBA Big Board on the show and all of that good stuff. Um, And we'll figure out who exactly the Raptors should draft with either the 11th to 18th pick. Somewhere in there is where they're going to end up. Um, And I think, uh, yeah, for me, this is going to be more about sort of like philosophy going in. Obviously, like best player available is the standard philosophy. Just take the best guy and figure it out later. But for this team, maybe there is something to drafting for need a little bit more, right? Just because the needs on this team are so specific and easy to pinpoint, drafting someone who can address those needs would be awesome. 
Uh, obviously, three point shooting is big. Guard play, big. Um, you know, any extra shooting at all is going to be a value here. So please don't draft a you know a rangy six eight dude who can't shoot but has high upside. Please don't do that. I think we've had enough of that for for the next little while. The roster's loaded with those dudes. For me, a guy, just like a very early, hmm, I kind of like that guy, not a very hard take, but the guy who has stood out to me just from watching the little bit of March Madness that I did and doing some reading on prospects, Cason Wallace from Kentucky is the kind of the guy who stands out to me in that mid tier first round range who you know really really good rugged defensive player has shot like 34 and a half percent from three uh as a, as a i think a freshman not exactly sure on his status or his classman level um either way Cason wallace is the guy that comes up as like oh he's like a pretty big defensively forward guard who has maybe some shooting chops that to me feels like kind of the sweet spot of where you want to go. Again, maybe there's some can't miss prospect on the wing who has dropped for some reason and you got to take them. But uh, I think probably a guy like Cason Wallace or someone of that ilk is probably the way to go. But again, I'll have stronger opinions on that as we get closer to the draft. If you are a draft person and uh, either agree or strongly disagree with my thought of Cason Wallace being the guy for the Raptors, please let me know either in the comments or in the Discord chat. Uh, thank you for that. Next question here comes from Liam Milford. What is one single change you would make to this team to improve results next season, accounting for hypothetical progression, regression? Love from Australia. Wow. Uh, thanks, Liam. Um, the question here, one single change I'd make to the team. I think I'm pretty on record. Like I think the top six players, top seven players, whatever you want to call it. I don't think I would do too much tinkering. Honestly, I think Scotty Barnes's growth is going to kind of lift the tide of everyone on the team, and it, it, eventually it will be centered around him. Maybe it's as early as next season. I don't think that's a problem. I think um, it's a patient time right now. You got to wait it out. That sucks. No one wants to wait for their team to kind of get to the place they're going to go, but I think Scotty Barnes is going to get there. I don't think there's any massive sweeping change I would make. I do think just kind of reassembling the bench collection and just getting a little bit more shooting in there somehow is like the obvious one, obviously like more shooting. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not telling tales at a school here. I'm not, you know, breaking new ground. Um, and then as far as like other changes, honestly, I think it's time with Nick Nurse. I, I just think a fresh voice would be nice, a fresh perspective, um, maybe someone who's a little bit more pro player friendly. Um, not to say Nick Nurse isn't because I'm sure he's got his virtues with the way he deals with players, but Maybe it's just time. Five years is a long time for a head coach to be at the helm, especially a guy like Nick Nurse who can be kind of abrasive um, and has some pretty like dyed in the wool, it seems, philosophies about basketball. That for me is the change, but uh, we'll see that we're going to get word on that pretty soon, I would guess. Last question here, very stupid question, and I mean that in the best possible way. James Duncan Simpson from Instagram asking, what would make for better TV? Precious Achua as a dater on the acclaimed world-class reality TV show Love is Blind, or Scotty Barnes as the host of Dirty Jobs, uh, and why? I think this one is extremely easy. It's Scotty Barnes as the host of Dirty Jobs. I want to see Scotty Barnes have to, you know, like, see what it's like to have to go down in the sewers. He would probably have some really fun commentary on that. Um, Dirty Jobs, I haven't watched that show in ages. I don't even know if that show's still on. Um, but it never was one I, like, liked because I don't like being grossed out on TV. But I feel like Scotty Barnes would have, like, the right tone and tenor for it and, like, kind of would take the piss out of the whole concept. Whereas Precious Achua, I think for Love is Blind... He strikes me as the type of guy who would never need to go on that show. He's handsome. He's articulate. Uh, he seems like he's pretty normal in the head. I don't find that to be the case for anybody who goes on Love is Blind. And I think if Precious Achua were to go on, he would stick out like a sore, sore thumb. Like, uh, why is this normal person on this show? Um, that's kind of my read on it. I don't think Precious Achua would be very good on Love is Blind because those people are unhinged. Uh, <laughs> I just don't think that's the case about our boy, Precious Achua. A good question to close it out here, to round out your week. Thank you to all those who sent in questions. Thank you to those who have joined the Discord chat. Uh, feel free, 
to jump in there. Game tonight, Raptors Celtics. You can go in and have some fun talking about it. Um, there's lots of different channels in there for different lines of conversation too. And I'm having a good time just chatting with the listeners and stuff. So the Discord channel, I can't recommend it enough. Doing some big advertising for it on today's show, I guess. Down in the description of the show on audio and video, jump on in there. The invite link should still be good for a few more days before I have to refresh it. So pop on in there and uh, looking forward to chatting with you and building a little Locked On Raptors community in the Discord server. We'll leave it there. Thank you so, so much for tuning in. Uh, We'll be back again on Monday to break down the end of the regular season. Maybe we know, well, we will know for sure where the Raptors are, but maybe something crazy has gone down and the Atlanta Hawks have Atlanta Hawks everywhere and the Raptors find themselves in the 7-8 game. We shall see. I doubt it, but we shall see. And we will certainly look ahead to the Raptors game against the Bulls if it is, in fact, going down next Wednesday. We'll get our boy, uh, one of our boys, either Hayes or Pat, the designer from Locked On Bulls on the show to talk about that game, get it all previewed for you. Vivek Jacob will be back along. He was away on vacation this week, soaking up some sun. He should be back on Monday. We'll dig into all of the stuff from the weekend and break down, put a bow on the season. That's what we have to look forward to next week, playing next week. That's going to be fun. We're going to have a great time with it, and I had a great time on today's show. Thanks for sending in your questions. Go make your next listen of the day. Locked on Leafs as the Buds lost last night in overtime or the shootout to the Boston Bruins, but still are in good shape going into the playoffs, hosting the Tampa Bay Lightning. Get all the readout on that series from our pals Mike and Dave over on Locked on Leafs. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning in, and thanks for hanging. Bye-bye.